Hey everyone, it's Mr. Warren Hayes. Welcome again to another AEW Dynamite review. It's November 10 right now, the moment I'm recording. So we are going to be talking about the November 9th edition of AEW Dynamite. But first and foremost, before we do anything else, before we go any further, look, let's just get the rigmarole out of the way. Give this video a like if you're watching this on youtube.com slash Mr. Warren Hayes right now. Give it a give the video a like and uh, or subscribe to the channel. That would be even better. Would be even greater. That way you won't miss out on a thing. Because yeah, I do quite a few things here on the channel, including these reviews. There's also the Mr. Warren Hayes Show proper, right? Which I record every Tuesday night, which is also available here on demand whenever you want. Uh, at this point, I recorded it this week. Talked about New Japan uh, quite a bit. Battle Autumn results, World Tag League, Super Junior Tag League, and on top of that, you know, sort of talked about how I'm uh, I'm kind of tired of WWE as well. So uh, lots uh, lots went down this week on the edition. So be sure to check that out. You can also check it out in your favorite podcast application, right? Because the Mr. Warren Hayes Show is available as a podcast feed for audio files. People who just like to have their their ears assaulted by you know the stimuli <laughs> that is the mr warren hayes show uh, <laughs> uh so yeah i mean and, and you can also show a bit you know a bit of support there as well by giving a five-star review on apple Podcasts, five-star rating on spotify subscribe follow join favorite whatever you can do that kind of stuff is fantastic always helps out the channel always helps out the podcast always helps out period hmm as we get into uh, today's activities, though, which is uh, as as we mentioned, you know, the, this week's dynamite. Before you know, before we actually get into the nitty gritty of stuff, I guess you know some of the outstanding, you know, the, the most newsworthy things to come out of this week's dynamite. Or you know, I, we've added two more matches to the uh, to the full gear card. Full gear, of course, uh, going just you know two weeks away at this point. Uh, we got ourselves a pretty good card here. Um, so the matches that were added last night were Dr. Britt Baker versus Soraya uh, in a one-on-one -on -one encounter. So Soraya's first uh, wrestling match since 2017. Uh, that's that's pretty noteworthy stuff in and about itself. We're going to talk about the, of course, the the promo last night as we talk uh, as we get into the nitty gritty here. And we're also going to get Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal versus Sting and Darby Allen at Full Gear. And if you if you're already uh, you know a, addicted to the uh, to the uh, AEW Dynamite review here <laughs> on the show, uh, well then you know that this is a thing that I called, and I was like, look, if we get this, this will be fine. And you know it has the potential. This match has the potential to be one of the most fun matches on the show. I'm not saying five-star classic. I'm not saying, you know, a, a work rate f phenomenon. This is just going to be fun. And, it, you know, if you're completely apathetic to the interactions between Sting and Jeff Jarrett, ah, well, you know, I can only blame Jeff Jarrett for this <laughs> because yeah, I can understand why some people might be turned off. But, you know, I'm not necessarily the biggest Jeff Jarrett fan in the world. But, you know, having Sting no sell a guitar shot, I'm here for that. The, uh, this, it'll be a lot of fun. This is being added to a card which is, uh, like I said, pretty already pretty stacked up here. We have, of course, in the main event, John Moxley versus MJF. We have the acclaimed versus Swerving Our Glory for the AEW World Tag Team titles. We're going to have uh, the uh, World Championship Eliminator Tournament Finals, of course. Uh, Tony Storm versus Jamie Hayter for the interim AEW Women's World Championship. Also going to get Chris Jericho. Uh, Chris Jericho uh, defending the Ring of Honor Championship against Brian Danielson, Claudio Castagnoli, and Sammy Guevara. And we also have Jade Cargill versus Nyla Rose. For the TBS Championship, don't forget that Nyla Rose is uh, is not <laughs> the AEW like not officially. I think she's the she's the AEW uh, the the TBS uh, champion in our hearts, right? 
but she is absolutely, you know, not like not officially. I'm enjoying this card. I think this is a good, uh, this is a, 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 a show that is putting a lot of, uh, uh, f- uh, 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 that's putting a lot of, um, uh, uh, of good things forward here. There's a lot of, um, uh, you know, I've talked about this, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, maybe you know, last week was a bit of an exception in regards to the direction that I felt AEW had was taking the the uh, uh, how the how Dynamite felt uh, like it had found a direction again, like everything felt like it had purpose. We weren't just it wasn't just a scattered scattered brain scattered brain thing. We just now we have um, you know everything everything seems to have found like. Some uh, something grounded uh, stuff to sink your teeth into. I'm enjoying how this card is coming together. Um, of course, you know, in typical AEW fashion, we're going to get the like the final card really the day before. There's some things I think you know if you're paying attention, you're like, okay, this is going to end up on the pay per view, no doubt. Here, you have just, they just haven't been announced, hasn't come together quite yet, but you know it's on its way. And we're going to talk about it, of course, as we go along. You know, some things are a little more obvious than others. Others, look, we'll, we'll talk about it in a second. That's what I'm trying to say. But um, I think this is an interesting card. And um, as far as, the, you know, the business standpoint of it, I'm still thinking about it. And I still want to see how this card ends up developing here. And I want to see how the go-home show looks like. But I can't help but think that this is going to do better business than All Out. I can't help but think so. Um, As you may recall, uh, you know, AEW, uh, AEW's All Out this year did 139,000 pay-per-view buys, which of course was a considerable drop from All Out last year, but there was no way they were going to top all Out 2021, which is the return to the ring of CM Punk. That's a whole other deal here. But the summer was what it was for AEW. Uh, I didn't think it was as dire as many people pointed it out to be. But I think to say that there was some confusion is, um, is uh, you know, is a fair argument to have in retrospect. And, um, you know, there was a lot of feelings around... You know, the, the main event not being booked officially, despite the fact that everyone was really expecting Mox and CM Punk, but no one was expecting, the, 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 having the match not being announced until the week before, I thought was an interesting strategy. Like, let's see how, <laughs> bold strategy, Cotton, let's see how this plays out kind of thing. Uh, and um, I had thought that the, the you know, the um, the show would do, a little better than this. I think, you know, at 139,000, as more and more res, uh, confer- confirmed buys keep coming in, I still think it's a little on the low side of what I had predicted. Um, Full Gear yeah, last year did 155,000 buys. Uh, again, you know, without the influence of CM Punk, without, you know, you know, Dynamite doesn't feel like the hot, hot, hot product it was last year, uh, will it do a hundred and, you know, and, and, you know, live attendance is down, uh, ratings are still pretty good, they've, you know, they're maintaining around the upper 900,000s for overall viewership, sometimes, you know, piercing the 1 million mark, I'm doing this before we get, uh, I'm recording this before uh, ratings for last night's Dynamite come out, because honestly, it's not, you know, it's not a focus of my analysis or what I want to talk about anyway. But, you know, ratings are pretty much in the same place. Uh, I don't think it would be impossible to consider it doing 155,000. I think there's a lot of interest around MJF and John Moxley. Um, you know, the, 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 my, there might be an extra surprise or two at the, at the pay-per-view as well. So, you know, I'm thinking... And, but I'm still going to think about it, with, uh, outs- and, uh, and I'm not necessarily going to, you know, dive in and say, well, this is my official prediction for how many buys it's going to do. But I wouldn't be surprised if it does less than 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 last year. I, I, 
you know, we're, you know, last year we're in the afterglow of CM Punk's debut. Um, and, uh, you know, outside of that, you know, that, you know, there's not none of that around this year, but man, this is still a solid card. It's still a solid card that was really well put together, well developed over the past few months. Um, I don't know if it's enough for people to tune in. I don't know to buy the show, I should say. I'm still going to think about it a little bit because I'm not I'm not convinced yet. And uh, I, you know, I'd love to be able to see the go home show. I, pr- I won't be able to see the go home show. before. Well, yes, I will be able to see the go home show. So I might make I'll give you my predictions on next week. Uh, Dynamite review. Because I was thinking about the Mr. Warren Hayes show. I was like, Wait, no, the Mr. Warren Hayes show is on Tuesdays now. But no, I'll be able to do this next th- next Thursday. We'll see what happens. But I, I think the card is interesting at this point. I think that there's a lot of a lot of good stuff put together. I'll be doing a prediction show this weekend. Hopefully, you guys will tune in and gals and non-binary pals as well. <laughs> um, because, uh, yeah, no, it, it, we'll, we'll have all of that set up this weekend. It'll be a good time. A little extra content. I'll be recording it this weekend, releasing it next week. We'll see. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll be able to dive a little deeper in the card, but as it stands right now, you know what? I like it. I'm interested. Plus, you know that that so you know that the the fact that we got an extra two matches announced on Dynamite last night last night that's news. But I think you know the, another significant amount of another significant piece of news is the fact that um, well we got the latest tease for the return of the elite, um, and uh, you know. Clocks ticking down to midnight, uh, you know, industrial steampunk-like gears <laughs> parading around. I think some people found that you know, found all this imagery available on Adobe Stock, which is fine. I use Adobe Stock, you know. You can't always be shooting original material all the time. That's that's why these, you know, that's why these services exist. Pexels and Adobe Stock and Shutterstock and so on. They, they, they have their uses. That's what they're for. You just want to get a point across. You don't necessarily want to, you know, you don't want to turn into Scorsese all of a sudden. You just want, hey, let's get the, let's slap these things together. Anyway, this is what we have now. I think, you know, it, basically this tease pretty much clearly established that the elite are returning at full gear. And I think the promise of that might might uh, ignite a few more buys. I think they, I, I, you know, I, I think there's a reason why we're doing this at full gear. And uh, you know, if I'm Tony and I'm a little worried that All Out didn't, I'm saying that All Out didn't deliver. I don't know what their projections were. I, I'm pretty sure they were. I would assume. That they were thinking they were going to do a little more business than this, you know, uh, than they did that. So maybe you know they're coming into full gear and they're like, you know what? Let's just uh, let's just stack this card and let's give them a tease. Let's give them a good old fashioned tease that these guys that have been missing for for weeks at this point, a couple of months, are 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 coming back, and there's going to be a whole new direction here. And you get whatever happens, and you know what? Look, whatever happens, whether it doesn't translate necessarily into more buys it might translate into bigger ratings on wednesday if the elite make a splash and just and we're calling them the elite right but i think the you know the overall message that is coming out of their 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 little video packages is you know they've been erasing the concept of elite right like removing the e from all elite wrestling uh, you know, I mentioned it this week on the Mr. Warren Hay show. You know, you probably saw the news that uh, the Jacksons, via their company, Killing the Business Inc., uh, trademarked the Wayward Sons for sports entertainment purposes. Whatever, you know, whatever, whatever it was. I don't remember the, but they did trademark it in in, in that concept. So, you know, I think this this is part of a rebrand. For them, this concept of elite is going to uh, disappear. And, you know, are they going to be called the wayward sons moving forward? Maybe. Because you know what? It would, it would, 
I mean, look, we don't know how involved everything is still legally right now, right? But, you know, if if you want to lean into that to bring, to create some, some storyline, some kayfabe, you're Kenny Omega, you're the Jacksons, you're coming back, uh, you know, why not come back a little bitter? Having a little chip on your shoulder, being like, you know what? You know, we created this company, we brought it forward, and then suddenly we were kicked out of it. You know, we're coming home. We're coming home. We're the wayward sons returning home. But we have a bit of a problem here. And whatever was elite in the past, well, we're done with that because clearly all elite wrestling is not interested in the elite kind of thing. And, you know, Cody is gone, you know, and so on. I think there's a lot of uh, pretty fun connections you can make here. I, I'm very interested to see how this gets handled uh, storyline wise. I'm very, very curious to see what happens. Also of note, you know, on the card, if we go back to the card, no Hangman Adam Page announced, which I'm completely comfortable with. Uh, you know, um, rest and, uh, you know, get well soon, Hangman, take your time. Uh, we want you back in top condition. So whatever time it takes, let him take it. The thing here is that it makes you wonder what was, what plans they had for Hangman in this situation. Was he, was he supposed to have a, a, a singles match with someone just uh, on the card? Um, you know, maybe they were looking to accelerate. Maybe was the Elite's return supposed to be a little maybe accelerated a little bit for hangman purposes or was he going to be a part of the eliminator tournament you know like what would have been the thing for hangman on this card the way things are all packaged right now it, i feel like it's difficult to point to one thing and say oh well this is happening because hangman got injured you know what i mean like you can't really you can't really point to well this is the hangman adam page plan b because everything feels everything feels like it has a place that it hasn't necessarily been shoehorned in necessarily you know because hangman didn't have a clear direction didn't have a clear feud you know probably something would have appeared after the mox match but as it stands right now didn't know exactly where they where they were specifically wanted to like, there, there were no indications as to where Tony Khan wanted to take this. Those are some notes off of last night's show. Heading into full gear. This is going to be the, con the topic of conversation. So, subscribe to the Mr. Warren Hayes Show uh, YouTube channel or podcast. Make sure you don't miss the all-out uh, 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 predictions uh, show <laughs> that I will be having this weekend. Uh, that I will be having this weekend, and by the way, you know, might as well go ahead and and just and just say it. we'll be recording this this weekend. Uh, it will be available for everyone, but uh, I will be joined by uh, by Haley and Kylie of um, of Tag Talk, which I'm excited about. They they're both going to be uh, joining me for the first time. We actually get to do anything together. That we're going to be chatting uh, about wrestling. So hell, it, it, I'm I'm really stoked for this. I'm really stoked for this. It'll be fun. It'll be a good time. You won't have to listen just to my stupid ass opinions the whole way through. Have, have Haley and Kylie there to help out. In the meantime, so subscribe. That way you won't need it. But in the meantime, let's get to uh, last night's Dynamite. From the Agonis Arena. Agonis? Agonis? I didn't. How do you pronounce it? In Boston, Massachusetts. Agonis Arena. I didn't, and of course, uh, you know, I didn't check this out before time, you know. Oh, uh, you know, Boston University. Host America, um, America East basketball. All right, great. Oh, look at this. Hosted uh, TNA Wrestling's anniversary show, Slammiversary, in 2013. I am not super familiar with the Agonist Arena. This was, it's not the first time 
That AEW's been there. All right, sweet. You learn something new every day. Show started off with an eight-man tag match. FTR and the Acclaimed defeated the Guns and Swerve in our glory. And look, you start the show off putting two of your most over acts in the company, right? Together in a team. And what do you get? You get a molten hot crowd that's just, you know, chomping at the bit. And then not only that, like they do that, you know, you get... The acclaim, FTR comes out to a huge reaction. Uh, the acclaim come out, but they they don't come out with Billy Gunn because then they come to the ring and before the match starts, they, you know, as Max Caster's finishing his rap, Billy Gunn, you know, hits hits the ground running, comes you know sprinting down the ramp and goes right for Swerve who's in the ring, right? Because Swerve fucked up his uh, his fingers, right? You gotta love this. I mean, that was a it was a great start. And this was before the bell rang. The referee did, you know, they 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 got them separated, but the referee didn't call the match. He didn't get and you know, all of this made sense. That's why Billy Gunn didn't come out and wait till the rap was done. He's like, no, no, I'm gonna wait backstage. You do your thing, but once it's done, motherfucker, I'm coming for him. I like it. This all makes sense. And, you know, the, Austin Gunn eats fists from the baby faces and they all do mount, mounted punches on all of the heels plus Keith Lee. I think Keith Lee's a bit, you know, don't quite call him a heel. He's the odd man out in here. But they're all doing corner mounted punches. Uh, the baby faces quadruple team uh, uh, Keith Lee. But then William Morrissey, W. Morrissey, <laughs> takes out Dax on the floor uh, Dax Harwood, he becomes the baby face in peril for the better part of this match here. Uh, eventually, Anthony Bowens gets the hot tag, hits a Famouser on uh, Colton. But the guns hit the big rig on Bowens. Of course, that's unsuccessful. All the teams square up for a four-on-four face down. You know, they're all in the ring. Except Keith Lee, where he's like, man, you guys, this is so dumb. You know, he's like, all right, don't do it. You know, he's like, all right. Keith Lee power bombs Anthony Bowens on a standing Max Caster, which was pretty cool. Swerve lands a Torrillo off the top rope to the floor. And Dax superplexes a gun off the top turnbuckle to the floor, which was great stuff. Back in the ring, we get a sharpshooter by Dax Harwood. Anthony Bowens lands the arrival. The mic drop by Max Caster. And a big rig seals the deal for the baby faces who win the match. Fun little match. Nothing out of the ordinary, nothing, you know, nothing to write home to mama, but uh, but good times, you know, a fun opener. I'll take that over any day of the week. I'll take that over anything else. Open it like uh, uh, the match was hot. Crowd was into it. Action was fine. It was clearly clearly designed for the for the baby faces to get some to get some heat here. I'm excited. It's good stuff. Continuing to just sow some sow some discontent between Swerve and um and Keith Lee at the same time, right? And 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 you know, they did hit a couple of tag team moves uh during the match, and as commentary was putting forward, when these guys are on the same page, it really clicks, and you're right, and they're right. It translates into the ring. But they don't get along these days. Keith Lee's annoyed. Swerve is like, man, this guy's he, what a square I'm hanging out with, you know? We get an MJF promo pre taped at the uh, Pardon My Take podcast. So MJF went on to a podcast. Well, well you know, the, the, the biggest sports podcast right now. And, uh, and he uh, he cut a promo on John Moxley. He wasn't at Dynamite. He apparently he uh, he has been. Uh, maybe you've read the news. He's uh, going to be in the uh, the Iron Claw film about the Von Erichs that uh, A twenty four is putting together. Uh, apparently he's uh, he's going to be a part of it. Uh, PW Insider reported that he's playing v- Lance Von Erich in this one. We're talking about it on Twitter and people 
people had me realizing that he should have been playing Gino Hernandez, who was, who would have been perfect. Let's be honest. He would have been so spot on ridiculously good as Hernandez. Because I was scratching my beard. I was like, well, he kind of looks like Ken Patera. Like there's something that you, you know, if you gave him the bit like the wild curly mullet like he could pull off Ken Patera, but Ken Patera was so like, but yeah, he was so re- crazy jacked. You know, he, he he couldn't get that jacked without getting onto supplements, which you know, Ken Patera. Um, and it was like, you know, talking about it, he could do a good Hennig too. Like, there's this, you know, you compare, you do a bit of a side by side, you know, of MJF and Kurt Hennig, and like, holy shit! But apparently, he's Lance. So you know, uh, he's. Doing this movie right now. Uh, so it, it, I'm not going to lie. It's a little weird to have the build up to uh, to Full Gear being a little sidetracked like this. With a little movie project film with MJF right now. Not being there to build to the to the pay-per-view. Um, not being there in the, you know, live, maybe wrestling a match, you know, I know his gimmick is that he only wrestles when it's important, like, I get it, I know, that's his thing, uh, but it's still, you know, there's still a little something there that you could, uh, there's a little nugget there that you could, that, that, that you could, that, that you could latch onto where you're like, you know, it's a, you get why he's not there, but you could latch onto the fact that he's not there and be like, you know, this is, this, might do the pay-per-view a disservice. So that's why it's like I'm ex- I'm curious to see what they're going to do with the um I'm curious to see what they're going to do with the uh with the go home show. Like, you kind of you kind of need them there. I mean like I'm not not showing any uh, any disrespect here. Good for him if he is if he if he's got himself a movie role. And that this ball is already starting to roll for him, you know. It's a little strange that he's not there. For, look, let's let's see where the cards fall here. But hey, the interview, the the promo, and it about itself, uh, he said he's been advised by doctors to stay off the road. Right? They're using the kayfabe attack by uh, the firm. To to say you know okay well we're putting we, we're pulling him off the road right he says that the match the, the 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 main event at full gear is important because it might just crown him as the face of the next generation of pro wrestling which happened to got with guys like Bruno San Martino Dusty Rhodes Ric Flair Hulk Hogan The Rock John Cena he said uh, he's had his spotlight stolen from him again and again. You know, one time it was because of a neck tattoo. The other time was because Matt Hardy was felt like Humpty Dumpty. Uh, the other time was, uh, you know, he had his uh, heat stolen from him by Chris Jericho. And I was like, because Chris Jericho fell into crash pads? No, he said for a full calendar year. He dodged that one right there. Uh, and then on his big return, when his spotlight was taken by a press conference. And I agree with with MJF and he was probably holding like you know there was there's there's a little more there's there's significant truth to what he's saying and that's the thing and you know I will always say that there's nothing better than a heel who's right in 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 pro wrestling when it, when you get a heel who is correct who is right to feel a certain way or when they have facts on their side to me there's nothing better and he's not entirely wrong here when it comes to the spotlight stuff when he, when he does a match and everything that envelops the discourse afterwards has it's has, either has nothing to do with him or is so completely insignificant. Like the neck tattoo. I remember when that happened. That's all people were fucking talking about. You know, a, a Chris Jericho, the crash pads during the, the, the blood and guts match. No one was talking that MJF threw him off. It's like all they could talk about were the fucking crash pads. And then, uh, and then CM Punk. And, well, you know, and you could even go as far as to say that CM Punk, because of his nonsense, because of him doing what he did, and now being persona non grata with the company, and probably, you know, most likely leaving, is cheating MJF out of the biggest match of his life, of his career. Because 
let's not forget that the most likely path, the of let not even most likely, the most obvious path was going to guide us back to MJF versus CM Punk once more. MJF CM Punk 3. Because let's not forget when the devil returned at All Out and unmasked and stood at the top of the ramp, it was after the CM Punk John Moxley match where CM Punk was hoisting a, a, a high the AEW title. That was clearly the path we were going. And that was clearly the match that we were building to to give Maxwell Jacob Friedman the match of his career, get the rubber match with CM Punk, win the title off of Punk. Like this is absolutely where we were going. He was cheated out of it again. His return, was, his, MJF's return to AEW after his hiatus was... Uh, was hijacked by all by the by the meta by the backstage stuff so he's not wrong anyway look another great promo another great promo by mjf and i've you know i've seen people have having problems with the fact that you know he's not there as well but he still cut the promo he still did the thing he he he, he cut it on a, on a podcast how gauche how very weird who cares who cares you get your your top guy, they work it into story. He cannot be there because of kayfabe reasons, but he still ends up cutting an excellent promo right there on TV and continues pushing the feud for it. I like the, you know, at some point we're just fishing for problems. I don't know why you'd be mad at this. Yes, I will concur. I will, like I said, it's a little weird. That he's not there in the build-up to the pay-per-view. It's a little strange. But I think they're doing pretty damn good regardless. Back from commercial, we get a Stokely Hathaway pre-tape where he talks about how he and MJF used to have the same goals and were best friends. But now, MJF is dick-riding John Moxley. And the worst crime you can commit... Is dick riding without a license? I, I don't know what to add. It is pure Stokely. Legendary line. It's going to be used time and time over by everyone online. It's great stuff. And he, you know, he throws out a threat. You know, he says, win, lose, or draw at full gear. He's going to see Max in hell. AEW World Title Eliminator Tournament first round match. Ethan Page defeated Eddie Kingston. Fun little physical match. You know, nothing, nothing mind-blowing here, but a, a good little physical match. Ends up on the floor and uh, Ethan Page hits a flying elbow off the apron. Back in the ring, Eddie Kingston hits an overhead suplex, a running power slam by Ethan Page. Follows the boys, strike each other. Kingston lands in some chops and a ridge hand and a DDT followed by an exploder. Kicks, Kingston gets Page into the stretch plum, but Stokely distracts the ref. Kingston breaks up the hold, eats a roundhouse kick by Ethan Page, followed by an avalanche. Ego's edge for the win. Great finish. Saw a lot of people getting preemptively upset at the idea that Eddie Kingston might lose this match. And again, like if you've been paying attention, there would be no reason for you to expect Eddie Kingston to win this match. And again, yeah, look, I'm a, I'm a huge Eddie Kingston guy. Eddie Kingston is uh, one of my favorite wrestlers doing it right now. Just absolutely fantastic, compelling, week after week. I love him. I go out of my way to watch his matches these days. Don't get me wrong. But the story they're telling right now, the two stories they're telling right now. On one hand, you have Ethan Page, who was on commentary recently, calling straight out John Moxley, saying, look, I'm coming for your title, Mox. 
you know you think you're so cool well, I'm cooler and he he flat out said it coming for and you know if you watched wrestling for any indication of time for and during any duration you should know that in these types of situations where you have multiple challengers you know, it's like oh he's gonna who's gonna win this match it's the guy who's speaking the loudest who's going to get the who's gonna get the win here we didn't hear Eddie Kingston cutting any promos on you know on Dynamite on, as to whether or not he was going to beat John Moxley or get on commentary and start saying that he was going to beat Moxley but Paige was that's clue number one clue number two Eddie Kingston right now is is in a is in a storyline where he he's lost direction he you know he gets mad he gets angry people are telling him you look you have to change your ways you're your own worst enemy you know now all the things that people usually say about Eddie Kingston being probably you know, being a problem to himself with his employers towards his employers I should say uh we're we're doing it right now we're doing it live you know Ortiz is trying to calm him down but this has been the story going on you know the sure things have been happening on dark eh, don't watch dark Warren. well it happened on dynamite a few weeks ago now you're just not paying attention if if this is going over your head they've had they've had you know little pre-tape set not pre-tape but interview segments backstage where ortiz is there with with kingston he says dude you have to calm down you know so it's all been happening right before our eyes Plus, on top of that, the overarching tale of Eddie Kingston that he never wins the big one, right? He never gets himself to a position where he wins the big one. Sure, he got the win over Chris Jericho. That's one thing, you know, but now, you know, we can start talking about, well, where's where's world champion Eddie Kingston? When is that going to happen? Where is his title? When does he get these flowers, right? Combine all of that together, you're like, of course, Eddie's not winning. That doesn't mean he's not in the story. That's not mean that he's not getting TV time because he is. Roosh is interviewed backstage. He's with the Dark Order. It's still Roosh and, and, and Jose, the assistant, trying to seduce ten, number 10 to go over to their side. And look, honestly, this all of this has to stop. All of this has like this is this is like this is akin to the Jay Lethal Darby Allen stuff. This has been dragging. Uh, I don't think there's really any substance. Like, it, it's just been completely direction. Uh, it's been without a rudder. It's been going all over the place. Shit or get off the pot. Let's do something with Preston Vance. And whether he stays in the dark order or not. Like, I don't give a shit at this point. This has to move forward. And the, I mean, the highlight, the highlight of this segment was uh, John Silver calling uh, Roosh a Roosh bag. Which I thought was funny as hell and reminded me why aren't we pushing John Silver? You know, we'll go as far as to say this. Why are we why are we insisting on keeping the Dark Order around doing pretty much nothing when they really could have gone to World Tag League this year? They being uh Silver and Reynolds, the Beaver Boys. Send them out there. It would have been fun as hell. What are you talking about? Don't tell me you would not have thought Silver and Reynolds in World Tag League would have been a good time. You're going to make a case for Chase Owens and Bad Luck Fale for me? You're going to tell me, you know, oh, no, no, I was really excited. Yeah, we absolutely had to save a spot for Hiroshi Tanahashi and Toru Yano. That's the team I want to see. Come on now. AEW TNT title match, Wardlow defeated Ari Davari in a squash. Ari Davari accepts the TNT Open Challenge. He does a thing with the butler, whatever. He tries to, he's trying to bribe Wardlow, you know. Anyway, this is a squash, Powerbomb Symphony, so on and so forth. After the match, this is where we get into the nitty gritty here. Wardlow calls out Will Hobbs. Will Hobbs is more than happy to, uh, to oblige. He comes out. Wardlow says to Hobbs, who is on the ramp, he says that the TNT title is his and it's always going to be his. And as a matter of fact, he's going to take every title in the company. Well, his tag team partner, Samoa Joe, who was ringside with him, was actually 
in the ring with him, kind of took offense to that and swat him across the head with the Ring of Honor TV title. And uh, this should come again as no surprise. You know, last week Wardlow was sort of going off on some shit and Joe was side-eyeing him a little. And you're like, oh, oh he's, he's getting the Samoa Joe side-eye. That This isn't good. This isn't good. So Samoa Joe, so War Joe is officially a thing of the past, which I, I'm not going to lie, kind of bums me out. I, w- I dug this combination. I dug these two massive behemoths together kind of thing. Uh, there, w- there was something, there was something to, that, to that duo. Lots of charisma, lots of natural physical charisma. Um, it worked for me, but we're already putting the plug on it, so... Um, you know, because, you know, make no mistake about it. Samoa Joe ch- choked out uh, Wardlow. Hobbs says he's going to kick Joe's ass too. So this, you know, we were talking about matches that haven't been announced for officially. Because there has been matches announced. There's been at least one new match an- announced off of the Rampage tapings. But we don't do spoilers here. So we're going to keep with what's been officially announced. And, um... The uh, we can absolutely, you know, ab- we can absolutely see. Uh, there's, there's, I could absolutely see a a a, a triple three way match. Not a triple three way match, but you know, uh, a a a a a, a, a three way match for the um, uh, yeah, a three way match for the uh, for for full gear. Between all three of those huge dudes, right? Um, uh, so yeah, so there, there's there, there's that possibility there. Um, but uh, the question that, that that comes out of this is, who? Wh- what title do you put on the line, right? And I've seen you know already you know in discussions like. Uh, for both and I'm like no that's a that's a little lame let's have a little fun with this instead why not have a little fun with this instead right why not go for you know why not go why not put one title on the line at full gear since we're on AEW show let's put the TNT title up for grabs and then let's redo the match the triple threat at final battle in about a month for the TV title, the Ring of Honor TV title. Why not do... That's already a little more fun. The guys can try out some stuff on one match and then, you know, try out all the spots that they didn't that they couldn't do or didn't want to do on the other. Why not? Otherwise, you do what? Uh, otherwise, you do, you know, Wardlow versus Hobbs at full gear. And Hobbs takes the title off of Wardlow. And then you get, and then you do like, you know, you do like a series where, you know, Wardlow is is going to settle his scores, right? He's going to settle up his business. So he takes on Hobbs at, at, at full gear, loses the title at full gear to Hobbs. Why not strap up Will Hobbs? No one has an issue with that. I'd actually be for it. Uh, and then head to final battle and because Wardlow's like, and I, I haven't finished business with Samoa Joe now and head over there and have Wardlow win the title off of um, off of Joe. I mean, everyone is, st- the Ring of Honor stuff is all still on Dynamite. It's not as if he suddenly becomes exclusive to uh, to a show that uh, that doesn't exist right now, right? So there's another fun solution. Just, why would you want to, you know, triple threat for all the titles? I'm like, that's that's just lame. Like just the fact of having uh, a three way sort of, you know, takes me out of it a little bit. If it was like for all the marbles, I'm like, mm, unify the titles. What the fuck? Come on, people. Backstage, Jade Cargill and her, the, the baddies. Being chatted up by Renee Paquette. She says she's sick of Nyla Rose walking around with her title. And, you know, if she's going to be 
in uh, uh, at Rampage Friday in Boston. Well, then Jade is going to settle some business on Rampage this Friday in Boston. It was a pretty funny promo. Unintentionally funny. Then we get the in-ring interview between Britt Baker and Soraya. Now, Tony Schiavone's there to kick out the, the proceedings, but he soon just gets the hell out of Dodge. He knows when he's not needed. <laughs> Soraya wanted to speak to Britt face-to-face and get us out of the way. She's been cleared medically, okay? And, you know, if, you know, I'm pretty sure no one had any doubts off of last week's, like, honestly, you know, there, there were a lot of, a lot of doubts from the get-go when she showed up. They were able to, can she wrestle? Well, I mean, there's a fair chance she can. Otherwise, why would Tony Khan would just be buying her? Just for the star value, maybe, but, you know, maybe not to that point either. Look, she was cleared by Watkins spine, and that's not like, you know, someone's actual spine and his name is Watkins. No, Soraya tweeted out her 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 letter of, uh, uh, her clearing, right? The, the, the letter that, that, states that she's she's cleared she actually tweeted out uh watkins spines you know one of the biggest most one of the premier uh uh spine surgeons in the world specialized in pro athletes so no big surprise like i said that she's been cleared but i mean we you know we're covering it we're doubling down she's shutting up the you know the people who have any doubts or whether you know AEW is just like gonna let anyone wrestle look she got cleared by one of the top in the world let's go she's good Britt Baker back to the promo now Britt Baker says uh, asks if uh if you know if Soraya still knows how to do this her and, you know, it's a legitimate question Soraya's last match was in 2017 I mean it's a good question and one that we you know we do have to take into consideration here I had a little chit chat, you know, with some folks on, uh, on, on, you know, whatever Twitter has become, <laughs> and um, and you know, I'm 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 listening to all of this, and I'm uh, and I'm looking at, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm chatting it up, and you know, people, I, I hope it gets time, you know, which is a legitimate, uh, you know, for any wrestling match, you know, it's like we hope it gets time because you know, good pro wrestlers, the more time that they have on their hands in a match the better story that is told and you know of course we're excited about it but we do have to consider you know that this is Soraya's first match back hopefully and probably she's training she's hitting the ring she's trying to get some of the rest out but we don't know what shape she's in as far as her in ring goes no one has seen her wrestle in years so we don't know we don't know how much how how in shape you look. I mean clearly like she's still in shape but you know ring shape can she can she do this can she wash everything off how long has she been training to get back on her feet like if I'm Tony Khan at this point next week I'm giving her a TV match I'm putting her on television because if and and not even a question of uh well you know I I want we, the, the audience needs to see that she can still go that's not even that kind of question it's more like the audience needs to, not even the audience, excuse me, Soraya just needs to get in front of a live crowd again and do this and and and, and shake off the, the initial nerves of getting back into, you, I, I, that's what I do. I don't want her to have her, like her first in-ring experience back after a severe neck injury, freshly, uh, 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 freshly, uh, 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 you know, uh, um, uh, cleared to wrestle without having at least one in the can where, you know, just, again, just got rid of the nerves. Because not only is she fighting on pay-per-view against Britt Baker, which is going to be a big deal for the company, she's wrestling her first match back. I'd be doing it. I would absolutely do it. And you'll notice, I don't think, they advertise it as Soraya's first match back, right? I don't think they're advertising it as such. I don't think so. But, you know, the idea here is that, uh, so, you know, so you have that wiggle room, you know, and you can, um, There's, there's that wiggle room where it's just like, look, it's Britt Baker and Soraya. 
and have her first match on t have her first match on on free tv again just to let it happen right yeah no it's it's not being advertised as uh as her first match back Back to the promo. Um, Britt reminds everyone that, you know, she built the women's division brick by brick. You know, because it's all about, this is my house now, this is my house now, this is my... So now, they're, you know, they're all leaning into these analogies. So she, brill, she built it brick by brick and created a fortress. That's what she calls. It's more than a house, it's a fortress. One that wrestlers, not superstars, wanted to move into. That's in, just a little... <laughs> She says uh, she gets why Saraya is so fixated on her, though, and that's because Brit is everything Saraya wishes she could have been. She said, "You, Saraya, you left your house so that you could walk into mine." And then, you know, being the dentist that she is, she says they don't take walk-ins, make an appointment. Um. Soraya tells Brit that she's traveled up and down the UK and all over Europe for free because she loves the wrestling business. She got hit by a car, wrestled the same day. Okay, yes, you know, not, I, mm -hmm. not exactly, like, I get it. It's passionate and it's the nature of the business, but it's, you know, it says a lot about the business too. Um she uh, she said she she's wrestled in Madison Square Garden, the O2 and the Tokyo Dome. And I'm like, wait, when, <laughs> when did Brit, um, not Brit, but um, when, when did Soraya wrestle in front of the, wrestle in the Tokyo Dome? Like, cause I, I like, I'm, I, and I, and I racked my brain quite a bit and, you know, everyone seems to agree it never happened. Like Cork and Hall, absolutely. She absolutely did. Cork and Hall. But that is not the Tokyo Dome. Tokyo Dome is one of the biggest arenas in the world. It's the biggest arena in Japan. What are you talking about? Stadium. It's not even an arena. It's a stadium. Anyway, she didn't wrestle the Tokyo Dome. I thought it was funny, though. <laughs> I thought it was pretty funny. And, you know, and it doesn't bother me. Like, I'm, you know, I'm not going to sit here and nerd out and be like, Ugh. So, you know, I can't believe she said that. It's such a terrible... I'm not... These are, rest, you know, wrestlers. Wrestlers lie. Wrestlers cut promos. That's what they do. It's fine. You know, she she just... She kayfabed it up and that's all right. If you bought into it, well, that's all right too. You got worked. But... Sorry, I never worked the Tokyo though. Uh, she says she's been humiliated in front of millions of people and had her addictions exposed. Uh, you know, we have to, we have to give credit to this because, you know, she is a, re she, she is, uh, in recovery, uh, and, uh, when she talked about she, her being humiliated in front of millions of people, I suspect that she is referring to the, uh, the sex tape, uh, which, you know, isn't an easy thing to go through. It couldn't have been an easy thing to go through. Uh, people were such awful, awful people towards her. Just terrible. And she said she's given her career and her neck for this business. And uh, and she said she's fight. She says that fighting here is another. And she says for 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 Brit, this is another opportunity handed to her on a silver platter, just like the opportunity to lead the women's division was handed to her by TK. And I thought that was a little odd. That's a little odd. We like Casaria. We understand how wrestling goes. Of course, the Booker gave the opportunity for Britt Baker to run with the division and she just so happens she did. She took the ball and she ran with it. There's like, there's nothing bad with that. You know, uh, she says this is her comeback story and the biggest match of Britt's career at full gear. Soraya then fights off Britt who attacks her and she lands the cradle DDT. What did you, the rampage? So I tweeted out last night well, after this happened that uh, that the, uh, Brit and Soraya needed this promo. It was meaty. I thought overall, without being perfect, I thought it was very good and it had the fire that was needed to make their match interesting because everything so far had been pretty, you know, now it, it kind of feels like 
we've swerved back onto the road after just like ah we swerved back on and we're in a good direction moving forward like the match feels like it should happen at the very least at this point right but my my main issue here is the you know this is my house stuff it's 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 Soraya moving in right and I think this is going to be something that's that AEW has to be careful of moving forward with her because the audience is going to turn on her in a in a second because I think everyone is really excited that you know that she's back so on and so forth you know that I think there's a contingent of fans that are really stoked that she's going to be wrestling again that's fine but we must not forget the context here Soraya coming in from the WWE saying I am going to make this division better. I'm going I'm going to save it. I've done revolutions before. This is my house. This kind of goes against everything everything AEW fans want out of AEW. They don't want WWE superstars coming in to say I am going to save this division. I'm going to save this promotion. You never heard John Moxley say that. You never heard Brian Danielson say that no one has ever come in from WWE saying I am now going to make this place better but this is what Soraya is implying this is what she's coming forward to say and she's saying I'm basically when she says this is my house now I'm going to remodel it to so that it looks like me like I like I've done this right whereas if you if you are an AEW fan, you've been following from the start, you know, kind of like myself, you can turn you can easily turn around and said, but wait a minute. Britt Baker carried this place, carried this division on her shoulders. She did it, and she's right. Again, like I was saying earlier, heels were right. It applies here. Britt Baker's right when she says, I built this place. I made this significant. I made the women's division something people talk about. She's not wrong. She is absolutely 100% not wrong. The the minute she turned heel, the minute they gave her a mic and they let her start her, they let her start cut promos, which has been fantastic. And you're going to you're going to turn around and tell me that you know, Soraya is going to come in and be like, "No, no, no. Everything that happened before doesn't matter now. It's my house now." And I'm like, "Wait a second. We can we can absolutely get behind uh we we it's easy for us to get behind our you know the women who actually were here from the start like Brit is not entirely wrong it's it and i don't think it's the biggest vote of confidence as far as uh, you know from a booking perspective it doesn't look like a like a a vote of confidence from the booker if he's letting the new girl who just came in from the big promotion, the the big place, I mean, and say, no, I'm going to revolutionize this, no big deal. And try to get her over as a baby face. That's my point. Because I think there's some, there's some elements from Soraya's discourse that would work very well if she were uh, a heel. If she's saying, you know, the women's division here needs a, a reshaping and I'm going to make it better. And you know what? It, it gets to a point where you're like, you know what? Everyone backstage, Riho, uh, Hikaru Shida, uh, Serena Deeb, throw in Thunder Rosa, throw in yeah, everyone who's been working at making the, the Jade Cargill. They should all come out and take offense to what Soraya is saying. You know what I mean? So, like, I think it's a very naive approach to this to this feud. Saying, you know, Soraya's going to make it better. Whereas Britt Baker's like, you know what? This It wasn't that bad a place. Because, you know, the criticism, I will only speak for myself here. Because I can't speak for everyone. But the criticism that I have always had in regards to the women's division was always in regards to the booking the amount of time that is allocated to women's wrestling in AEW on a weekly basis is laughable for the talent that they have 
I've been giving them some good praises recently because I think that the way that they've been booking with the multi-person matches, the multi-women matches, I think those are that's a good way to go to get the women over because AEW is a promotion that you can get over on your work rate. And Jamie Hayter is an example of that. Hikaru Shida is an example of that. Riho is an example of that. It's not, these are not... You know, these are not uh, women who cut stellar five-star promos. These aren't, you know, Dusty's kids when it comes to promos. But they got themselves over because of the work, because of their natural charisma, because of their talent. So, the, you know, my, my criticisms remain of the division. But that doesn't mean they don't have the talent. And they have world-class women in this company that they can put on TV and throw into the deep end without having someone come in and say, I'm going to save you all. It's very reductive. And I, and I didn't think that they were going to continue to push that part of the story. I think it's very strange. And it, it, it has the potential to blow up into Soraya's face. It has the potential to blow up in her face. They, 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 they have to tread very carefully here. If it was me, I I dump that. I I dump that. Because uh, what do you do at full gear? You're gonna have to, you're you're gonna have Soraya go over. What do you do after that? Then Soraya takes over. What does that even mean? What what is that thing? It's not Britt Baker's place anymore. You know, it's, to a degree, I think Tony is spending maybe a little too much time on Twitter and seeing people get really, really upset at Britt Baker. Because there is a, a contingent of people who absolutely loathe Britt, who cannot stand her. And I don't understand why. I don't understand why. Oh, Lauren, she, she's not a very good wrestler. Then fuck off, she's not a very good wrestler. What, what are you talking about? Compared to whom? Compared to whom? Compared to, uh, 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 compared to Kanosuke Takeshita, maybe? Uh, compared to uh, Brian Danielson, maybe. But she is a, an absolutely capable, competent wrestler. What are you even talking about? And what are you going to do? Are, are you, are you going to tell me, uh, you know, uh, uh, from one side of your mouth, are you going to tell me Britt Baker, you know, I don't like her because she can't wrestle, but then on the other side, you're going to tell me that Jade Cargill is great? Is that what we're going to do? And no disrespect to Jade. Uh, you know, Jade fully knows that she's learning on the job. I don't understand. You know, and people, oh, she's always in the title picture. She hasn't been in the title picture for a while now. Let's cut this shit out. Oh, but she won the, 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 the Owen Hart tournament. This is booking. It's not on Brit. The, the amount of hatred Brit Baker gets is... It blows my mind because she is the best promo in the women's division by far when she's on a good night when she's when she's hitting her stride when she's not feeling awkward or you know she's an extraordinary good promo she's had her moments just like anyone just like John Moxley tonight I'll talk about that in a second it wasn't uh, an all-timer by Moxley tonight it was all right But we, I mean, stuff like this just blows my mind and I do not understand. I don't understand why Brit gets so much hate when Brit literally was the division for a while. Who else would you have elevated to Brit's position when she was there? Carrying the division, cutting promos, making people excited about her matches. Who was ready to take that spot? Anyway, let's move on. We get uh, early, we get a pre-tape from earlier on in the day. Sanjay Dutt, he's paying off Cole Carter for his help last week. And QT Marshall is there with the rest of the, uh, the factory. And he takes his cut. Look, this all leads to Danhausen and best friends coming in to yell at Lee Johnson. Lee Johnson sets a match with Orange Cassidy for the All-Atlantic title. And Trent Beretta wants to fight Jay Lethal. So we get Jay Lethal versus Trent Beretta immediately after this and uh, lethal attacks trent 
Um, uh, at the top of the ramp, when Trent is coming up and uh, coming out, still doing his his intro, gets chop blocked, locks in a figure four. He works the he works the knee. He being Jay Lethal works Trent's knee throughout the entire match. Figure four on the floor. Trent suplexes to fight back. He hits a half and half superplex. Satnam Singh, Sanjay Dutt, and Danhausen get into some shenanigans, which distract Trent and. Jay Lethal lands the lethal injection for, for the win. It was all right. After the match at the top of the ramp, Tony Schiavone tries to interview Lethal and company, but Jeff Jarrett comes out and he takes the time to sort of create connections. Why are we all buddies here? Why are we all together? He says, well, Jay Lethal, I gave him his first contract. Sanjay Dutt has an, an IQ of 188 or something like 182, like a ridiculously high number. And, and, and we've been around the world together, I mean, working promotions. And then for Satnam Singh, well, he didn't have a real connection to him, right? They're working together for the first time. But he says he's a real monster, not, wear, not one wearing skinny red jeans in a banana nose circus. Now, if, if you didn't pick up on it, this was the line of the night, as good as Stokely's was. This just came so much out of the blue from Jeff Jarrett, who is a known guy for grieve, for airing grievances out in the open. Not an issue. The red, the, 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 the phony skinny jean, red skinny jean monster is Braun Strongman from World Wrestling Entertainment. That was very, very obvious. So JJ, Double J, ain't he great? Uh, tapping into the zeitgeist and going, you know what? Strowman's a punching bag. Let me give him, let, let me get one lick in here. So there you go. Good for him. And the Banana No Circus, well, you know exactly who he's referring to. Probably a little bitter that the uh, the changing of the guard had uh, the changing of the guard at WWE pushed him out of his cozy uh, senior VP job over there uh, in, in, in WWE, right? Most likely. And instead, the, you know, the roadie takes his job, takes, this, takes his spot. So he, he, can, he can absolutely be a little pissed off at Triple H. I'm okay with this. I thought this was... A fantastic, just out of the blue line, and you know what? And th and then you see, oh, it, oh, it, oh, I wish they didn't mention WWE and uh, uh, I wish they kept that off TV. They're better than this. No, they're not. No, they're not. They're not better than this. AEW is not better than this. They're really not. And who cares? Who cares whether they're better or not? This is pro wrestling. I want more of it. It had been a while. Since we had some some proper some so, so, some proper shitting on WWE, you know that Saraya a couple of weeks ago who tried, you know, but people didn't quite buy it. This this was primo stuff. This was top of the line. Bring me this. Bring me more of this garbage nonsense of, of people showing up on other programming and taking shots at each other. I'm okay with this. I am absolutely fine with this. This is what makes this 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 this, this uh, uh, landscape right now exciting and fun. It's this kind of chaos. These kinds of shots coming out of the dark. Well, WWE will never steep to stoop to this. Well, okay. And you know what? Just so happens the product is really stale and fucking boring. So maybe they should be taking some shots across the bow. The bow. The bow. The bow. Shots across the bow. Christ, Warren, get your expressions and get line them up. Get them, get them, get them properly set up. Line them ducks up. <laughs> Jungle Jack Perry has a quick pre-tape where he wants to confront Christian Cage and Luchasaurus at Rampage. There we go. And then we get the John Moxley promo with really William Regal. Mox sort of sort of having a half, you know. Having a conversation with us and, you know, bouncing off of William Regal. He's like, they're telling stories, going down memory lane. And they end up, the, the, the thing being that they, they see a lot of MJF and a young John Moxley. He's got a chip on his shoulder. He's got something to prove, so on and so forth. And, you know, he's got a lot to prove to William Regal. Anyway, 
He said, uh, John says that MJF is having an existential crisis. He says that MJF puts on airs, dresses like a success, like he's a champ. But Mox is a multi-time millionaire champion and he's not fooling him. He's just the realest guy in the room. He says MJF calls himself a pillar, but there's no weight to this pillar. He also says MJF calls himself the devil, but Mox has seen the devil with his own eyes. And one guy in the audience shouts out, Vince McMahon! And I popped. Anyway, it ends up uh, uh, um, uh, with Mox just saying uh, that he wants uh, MJF to prove that he has what it takes. It was a, you know, a good promo. Don't get me wrong. It wasn't, but it wasn't one of these John Moxley, I'm going to sell you a ticket to this show promos. It, that wasn't it. It was good. It was a little, you know, little exposition to the story. But uh, it was good, but, you know, nothing mind-blowing. We know Mox has, you know, more, more, than, more uh, uh, gumption than this in a lot of his promos. I thought this one was a little awkward at times. It was all right. Then we get the video of the elite clocks, the gears. We talked about this at the start of the show. But uh, Jamie Hayter defeated Sky Blue. And this was a short, short match as it needed to be. The, the concept of lanes. Remember, folks, people, you know, wrestlers in AEW, they're in lanes. They have their lanes. Hayter needed to show that she's not in Sky Blue's lane. Not at all. That she deserves to be uh, the number one contender for the title, the interim title right now. And that Sky Blue still has a way to go. So we're good here. It's the kind of stepping up that we need Hater in. Um, I don't know what Tony Storm was brought out for, really, outside to really like hammer home the connection that Storm and Hater are gonna have a match. And they didn't even collide. It's, anyway. I thought this match was Sky Blue's best in AEW so far. It was all right for what it was. Backbreaker and uh, a T-bone suplex by Jamie Hater, a really nice code red by uh Sky Blue. Hater lands the rainmaker for the win. Every, you know, you know, everyone's just like chomping at the bit to call it a rainmaker, but they won't. They can't. They don't want to, because the rainmaker belongs to that that one dude. But when Jamie Hater is throwing the short arm lariat, that is a rainmaker, and I'm gonna call it the rainmaker. Hater beats up on Sky Blue a little too much. Storm, uh, Tony Storm then chases her off. That's essentially what she was for. I don't know. Fine little match. Served the purpose for Jamie Hater. Keep her hot. Keep her warmed up. She still gets great reactions. Super over. We get a Brian Cage, Dante Martin uh, pre-tape for the Eliminator Tournament happening on Rampage. Then Lance Archer is uh, beating up Ricky Starks, who is also his opponent because Lance Archer is going to be fighting Ricky Starks in the Eliminator Tournament. Um, I know a lot of people are very, very worried. Don't worry. Ricky Starks is not losing in the first round of the tournament. He's, Lance Archer has to head back to Japan soon because he's in World Tag League. He's uh, rejoining Suzuki Goon, or not rejoining, but he's joining his Suzuki Goon uh, mentor, Leader Minoru Suzuki uh, in World Tag League and uh, World Tag League starts like in uh, 10 days. So now nah, he'll be gone for a while. He, so Lance Archer uh, is not winning the first round. Ricky Starks will. And when, if you consider the trajectory of a Ricky Starks, let's say, defeating Lance Archer, defeating uh, Brian Cage to get to the finals, uh, he's going through some massive, uh, some mass, massive mounds of meat here to get to that spot so i can get behind that story and then we had the best two out of three falls match brian danielson defeated sammy guevara uh this was a very 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 good main event that capped off the night very strong uh unquestionably the match of the night i don't think this was a dynamite that was particularly uh uh, uh focused on the in-ring work i thought it was a little meh on that level, I thought it, you know, it was still f interesting and there were things still, you know, we still had storylines happening. It wasn't the, it wasn't the chaos that it was last week. 
you know, um, yeah, but everything felt purposeful. Everything still, you're, okay, we still see where we're going with this. Everything is making a lot of sense. Um, Danielson, look, in this match, he goes hard early on because, right, because the, the point of controversy here is Sammy Guevara, you know, giving up a, a, a pin uh, by launching a chair at, at Brian Danielson, right? And and everyone's like, Ugh, what shitty bookings, so on and so forth. But look, they had twenty minutes on the, uh, uh, they had twenty minutes for this match, which is pretty long, and it, for a two out of three, which is pretty long for a main event. You could argue that a two out of three falls should go longer, and I agree, you know. But this is a good way to to book it that way. Plus, it made sense in the story. But again, for that, you have to be paying attention. If you, and if you had been paying attention to the start of the match, Guevara was completely outclassed. Danielson was just going hard on him. He hit that massive uh, uh, missile shotgun drop kick. It was just like, oh my God, my own chest caved in on that one. And he's just going hard, super hard on, um, uh, on Guevara. And Guevara can't get anything in edgewise. So what does Guevara do? He goes to the outside. He cheats. He gives up. A, he gives up a a, a uh, the first one, the first fall, so that he can secure the second. Right. That's his, 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 so that he can secure the second, which he did because he was completely in control because he beat the shit out of uh, out of Danielson after the chair shot, poked him in the eye with all sorts of shit and just beat him up on the floor. Got got Danielson's eye his orbital all busted open and shit and hits a, DG, a GTH. There we go. And he's got his first fall. We're tied at two. We're tied at two and we've got like 15 minutes left of the match. What more do you want? This all made sense. Maybe not 15 minutes. Maybe what? 12, 11 minutes, 10 minutes, whatever. So Danielson eventually... Fails a diving headbutt. Uh, Guevara locks in a label lock. Danielson fights back with. There's a lot of counter moves between both guys. Um, eventually, Tay. Tay. Uh, uh, um, um, uh, excuse me. Danielson knocks Guevara out in the ring, covers, but uh, Tai Conti was there, of course, drags the ref out of the ring. She gets expelled from ringside. There's more back and forth until Sammy lands a shooting star press to the floor, which. Honestly, just you know, really didn't, it just really didn't connect. Um, there's a cutter attempt that's countered by a Juji Katami by Danielson, and that's one of the things why you love watching Brian Danielson work because of that kind of stuff. He hits a poison rana as well, Busaikuni, which Guevara reverses into the walls and a lion tamer. Shout out Chris Jericho, but Danielson fights back, hits another Busaikuni. Somersault Springboard DDT by uh, Guevara, which was really cool. Goes for the Senton Atomico, but Danielson lifts his knees. Danielson beats him up some more and locks in the LaBelle lock for the win. This was a very, very, very good main event that people will avoid telling you that it's a main event because they hate Sammy Guevara with a passion. But it ruled. Like in all fairness and all object objectivity, this was a... This was a very good, very, very strong television main event. And you know what? Here's the cue I think we need to pick up on here. After the match, Danielson is selling that his eye hurts, right? And he's like, ah, you know, and he's having, you know, maybe that's a little something that's going to come into play for the full gear match, right? Because Jericho didn't, you know, he didn't approve of this match out of, you know, for for no reason he was hoping this is why heels have their cronies go and fight um go and fight you know their their, their main their the 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 main heels antagonists because they they want them to get injured they want them to get hurt Danielson got hurt maybe this you know the orbital bone the orbital thing is going to have uh significance in the in the full gear match so i'd say Keep that in your in, in your pocket. And there we go. That was AEW Dynamite. I I enjoyed it. I thought it was fun. It's not going to be a very memorable one, but um, we're going to need a big 
go home show. Quite frankly, you know, as we wrap this up, I would bring the elite back or whatever they're going to call themselves. Omega and the Jacksons. I'd bring them back next week. Because right now, the trios champions aren't doing anything on full gear. So I'd bring, I, I bring Omega, the Jacksons back next week, get people super pumped. That will bring in some extra buys. I'm convinced. Have them fight for the trios titles and get the trios titles back. That's what I do next. We need, I like next week, I really feel a big go home show is required. This was fine, but, and, and everything got its story bumps. Nothing was out of control. It wasn't chaos like last week, but we also know AEW can deliver more viscerally than this. This was fine, but I wouldn't call it my favorite dynamite of all time. Wouldn't call it one of the worst, far from it, but I usually and finish a dynamite feeling a lot more than this. This this one just didn't quite hit that hit that gear for me. But you can hit the subscribe button and a like if you enjoyed all of this. You can leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or a five-star rating over there on uh, uh, on Spotify. And those are great ways to help out the Mr. Warren Hay Show continue to grow. So stick around for that. I will be back this weekend with the AEW Full Gear Prediction Show. Uh, make sure that you're around for that. Otherwise, I'll be back with the Mr. Warren Hayes Show next week and another AEW Dynamite review next Thursday as we get into full gear. You don't want to miss any of this. In the meantime, thank you all very much for listening and I'll see you next time.